from our archives, the Bill Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me tonight to the third chapter of John's Gospel. This man Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, probably afraid of criticism or he had a desire for a private conversation or maybe he wanted to give some more thought before committing himself to Jesus Christ. In any event, he came and he asked Jesus some questions about spiritual life and Jesus looked him up and down and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. In fact, he said, verily, verily, and any time that Jesus uses that expression, that means that what is going to follow is very important. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must, you have to be born again if you are to enter the kingdom of heaven. Two years ago when we were touring Poland, while we were there we met a priest, a Monsignor, who is head of one of the largest theological seminaries in the world. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, I got my PhD degree at the University of Chicago. And one day I was riding in a bus and sitting behind me was a black woman. And she punched me on the shoulder and she said, Sir, I beg your pardon, but have you ever been born again? And he said, well, I suppose I have. He said, I'm a, I'm a priest. She said, that's not the question I ask you, sir. I ask you, had you been born again? And he said, well, I, 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 uh, she said, have you been born again? And he said, he went back to his rooms at the, at the university and got his Bible down and turned to the third chapter of John and reread this passage. And this passage spoke to him and he said he got on his knees and he had an experience with Christ that he's never been able to get away from. Now he said, my theology would tell me that I was probably born again at a different period, but he said something happened, you can call it anything you want to, commitment, recommitment, conversion, whatever, something happened to me. Now the question I want to ask you tonight is, has that ever happened to you? Give it some other title, some other name, if you want. Call it conversion, call it commitment, call it repentance, call it faith, call it whatever. Has it ever happened to you? Many of you have thought a long time about religion and Christianity. Are you committed? Are you committed to Jesus Christ? Jesus said you must be born again. Start with your hearts. Be born from above. You can be changed. The world could be changed. The country can be changed. A state can be changed. A family can be changed. A person can be changed. You can be changed. Now Nicodemus must have been stunned when Jesus said that to him because if Christ had said that to Zacchaeus who's a tax collector and they didn't like tax collectors then much more than they do now. But to say it to Nicodemus, one of the great religious leaders of his time, Nicodemus it says was a ruler. That meant that he was rich. He was religious and yet he was searching for reality. How many of you go to church but you're still searching? There's still an empty place in your heart and something tells you inside that you're not really right with God. You see, Nicodemus fasted two days a week. Do you know anybody in your church that does that? He spent two hours every day in prayer. How many people do you know that spend two hours every day in prayer? He tithed all his income. Not many people even do that these days. He was a professor at the theological school of theology and he worked hard at religion. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again. Born from above. Now why did Jesus say that to Nicodemus? Because he could read the heart of Nicodemus. He saw what was in him. He saw that he had covered himself with religion, but he had not yet found the real thing, fellowship with God. What causes all of our troubles in the world? Lying and cheating and hate and prejudice and social inequality and ultimately war? Jesus said these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. He said it's in our heart. He said our hearts need to be changed. Psychologists and sociologists and psychiatrists all recognize there's something wrong with man. There are many words in scripture to describe it. Fifth, I'll take only three words. 
One is called a transgression. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is a transgression of the law. What law? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever broken one of those commandments? Then you're guilty of all. It's also the breaking of the law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience at any time? Sure you have. And if you go against your conscience very long, your conscience becomes dull and duller and duller until after a while it's a seared conscience and a dead conscience. And your conscience is no longer a safe guide to go by. It leads you astray because you've gone against it so much. And then there's another one, a commandment, law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Have you always done that? No. Then you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of being born again. And then another word carries with it the idea of missing the mark or coming short of your duty and a failure to do what you ought to do. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And yet before you can get to heaven, you must, you must have righteousness. God says be perfect as I'm perfect, holy as I'm holy. Where are you going to get that perfection? You don't have it now. Where are you going to get that holiness? You don't have it now. But you can't get to heaven if you don't. That's why Christ died on the cross. He died on the cross and shed his blood to provide the righteousness for you. So that he provides you with the right kind of clothing to go to heaven. And the clothes that you must have are called the clothes of righteousness. And that was provided for you by Christ. And then there's another word. Iniquity, a turning aside from the straight path. Isaiah said, we are like sheep. We've gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Now here in Idaho, I know that I think this is a sheep state. Maybe the sheep state in the United States. I haven't seen any goats around yet. And maybe you have goats too. In New Zealand, they cross the sheep and the goats and they call them jeeps. That's a fact. And uh, when we were in New Zealand, I couldn't get over the fact of, of what they were doing. I don't know whether that improves them or destroys them. I don't know. But some of you don't know whether you're a sheep or a goat. Now, you see, Jesus said at the judgment, there's going to be the goats on this side and the sheep on this side. And the sheep are going to enter into the kingdom of God. Of course, there he's talking about the judgment of the nations, but it could be applied to individuals. Or it could be that you're a goat. And the goats are going to be cast into outer darkness, the Bible says. But one thing, you're not spiritually. You're not a jeep. You can't be both. You have to choose which one. And if you would like to make that choice watching by television, pick up that telephone and call that number that you see on the screen right now. And a counselor is standing by to talk to you and to help you find Christ as your Lord and Master. Help you with your spiritual problems. They're all over the country. So call right now. And if it's busy, call again. They'll be there all evening. If the lines are tied up, keep calling. Don't give up. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Thus a radical change is needed by every person. We need those sins forgiven. We need to be clothed in the righteousness of God for the purpose of finding fulfillment in this life. Finding something to commit yourself to. What are you committed to? Are you a committed person? Do you really believe in a cause? Do you really believe in a person that symbolizes that cause? Why don't you make your cause Christ and follow him? He'll never let you down. And then not only to find complete fulfillment in this life, but also to be acceptable with God. To be acceptable by God. Now some of you would ask the question, what is the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? You see, Nicodemus, like you and me, he wanted to understand it. He wanted to understand it. 
Now, I used an illustration years ago that I couldn't understand because I was born and reared on a dairy farm. And I still wake up at night with nightmares doing this way. <laughs> because I had to get up every morning during high school at 3 o'clock and milk 20 cows. And then when I came home from school, I had to milk those same 20 in the afternoon. My father had a small dairy, had about 60 cows that we milked, and then we would sell the milk door to door, have a little dairy truck that took the milk early in the morning. And that's all I remember almost as I was a boy because we worked hard on that dairy farm. But how can a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter? I don't understand that. Well, I'll tell you what, because I don't understand it, I'm never going to drink milk again. I've got to understand that before I can drink milk. I almost quit milk when the cow stepped in the bucket and it just kept on milking. I don't understand color television. Do you know that I am so old that I can remember when there was no television? And I tell that to one of my grandchildren, they look at me as though I came out of the ark. <laughs> I can remember when they were, we didn't have any radio. In fact, I remember the first station that came on there, it was KDKA in Pittsburgh, and my dad had an old crystal set, and he said, I think we've got it, got earphones, and we'd all stand around to try to listen. The only station on there in the United States. That's how old I am. Well, you can't imagine a world without paved highways. You ought to have seen the two ruts in front of our house that went clear to town. There were only two paved streets in our whole town. Well, suppose I would say, because I don't understand television, how somebody can be in Rome or New York or Jerusalem or someplace like that, and I can see him instantaneously on my set. I don't understand it. I'm not going to watch it. And I push the button to turn it off. I've got to understand it first. Why, well, you'd say you're crazy. Well, of course, I don't understand these computers. I don't understand all these things that they're developing. This whole scientific age has passed me by. We didn't study that in the school I went to. But I accept it by faith. You see, Nicodemus could see only the physical and the materialistic. And Jesus was talking about the spiritual. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when he said that, he did not mean that you can inherit it. You cannot inherit it. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your father and mother can be the greatest born-again Christians in the world, but that doesn't make you a born-again Christian. I can be born in a garage, but that doesn't make me a motor car. <laughs> and there are many people that have the idea that because they're born in a Christian home that they're automatically Christians. Well, you're not. And you cannot work your way alone. Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then reformation is not enough. You can reform and say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to have New Year's resolutions and all the rest of it. Isaiah said, all our righteousness is filthy rags and rags in the sight of God. If you take a pig and take him into your living room and into the bathroom, give him a good bath, wash him down with some Chanel number no. five, put a ribbon around his neck, bring him in the living room. You say, now I've got a new pig. He's, he's turned into a perfect gentleman. Look at him sitting over there. You open the door, let the pig out and see where he goes. His heart hasn't been changed. All of the outside had been changed. And that's the way with some of us. We've been changed some on the outside to conform to certain social standards or certain things that are expected of us in our churches. And yet down inside, we've never been changed. Now that's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. He said, Nicodemus, you need changing inside. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. You must be born from above. That's a supernatural act of God. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, disturbs you about the fact that you've sinned against God. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit 
regenerate you. That's when you're born again. And then the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart to help you in your daily life. You don't leave here alone without any help. The Spirit of God goes with you from now on to give you assurance, to give you joy, and to produce fruit in your life, and to teach you the Scriptures. You can't reform. That's not enough. And you can't imitate. You try to imitate Christ. They used to have, a, there was a book Sheldon wrote called In His Steps. And people thought that all you had to do was try to follow Jesus and try to do the things he did and you'd get to heaven. You can't do it. We can't live up to the Sermon on the Mount. You try living up to the Sermon on the Mount, literally. You can't do it. You don't have that kind of spiritual strength. I told a story that happened many years ago from a couple in Oklahoma. And they had read about this play in New York called My Fair Lady. And they told everybody they were going to New York and they were going to see My Fair Lady. What they didn't know is that it was sold out four or five months in advance. When they got there, they couldn't buy any tickets. So they said, what are we going to do? Our friends all back home will think we saw My Fair Lady. We're going to be embarrassed. So they hit upon a good idea. They went over and they bought one of the books that you could buy for a dollar that told all about the play. And then they saw people, they waited till people started coming out of the theater and they saw some of them throwing their tickets aside that had been cut in half. And so they went over and picked up some tickets. Then they began to hum and sing. I could have danced all night or on the street where she lives or one of those tunes in My Fair Lady. And when they got home, they were humming the tune. They had the book that told about it and they had the tickets. And everybody thought they'd been to see My Fair Lady. And that's the way you are. You know the religious language. You can sing the songs. You can even pray the prayers. The only thing is you haven't been to the foot of the cross and been born again. That's the message Jesus was trying to get over to this religious leader. Now to be born again means in Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. In Romans, Paul speaks of it as being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it being a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In Peter, Peter says, partakers of a divine nature. John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change in the whole philosophy and manner of living. Now, how is it accomplished? What happens? Well, there's a mystery. Jesus said the wind blows where it listeth, and you cannot tell from whence it cometh or where it goeth. You can see the result. Now, the other day, I did not see, when we had that terrible storm a couple days ago, I did not see the wind, did you? I saw the effects of it. I saw limbs flying by. Parts of a roof torn off flying by. The dust going by. The willow trees bending over. I saw the results of the wind, but I never actually saw the wind. And neither did you. You see, the wind blows where it listeth, Jesus said. There's a mystery to it. And the analogy of natural birth, I think, applies here. You see, Natural birth is the moment of conception. Then there's the nine months of gestation. And then there's actual birth. Now you may be in one of those stages tonight. This may be the moment of conception for you. It may be another stage of gestation. Or it may be actual birth. Only the Holy Spirit could answer that question. That's the mystery of it. There is a mystery that I cannot explain to you. And Jesus did not attempt to explain it to Nicodemus. You see, that's why we're to come by faith to Christ. We can never understand it. Our little finite minds cannot understand the infinite. Our finite minds cannot understand the mighty God. We come by simple childlike faith and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you are born again. But it happens this way. First, there has to be the reception of the Word of God. And I believe that is conception. 
First Peter 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then in Romans 10, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now tonight you are hearing, and you're hearing the word of God, and that's the first step. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, or declaration, or proclamation, to save them that believe. It sounds foolish that men can stand up and use words out of a Bible, and that has power to penetrate your heart and change your life. But it does, because it's God's holy word. This is not an ordinary book. This is a living book, a living word. And then there's the work of the Holy Spirit, as I've already explained. He convicts. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And then he indwells. He changes us. He changes our wills, our affections, our objectives for living, our disposition. He gives us a new purpose and new goals. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. And then he indwells. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Does God, the Holy Spirit, live in you? If there's a doubt about it, pick up that telephone if you're watching by television and call that number. And a counselor will be there to help you to make sure that you have been born again. You remember the story in the Bible of Naaman? Naaman was the general commander in chief of all the armies of Syria, and Syria is much in the news these days. He was commander in chief. He had everything. The king had honored him. But he was a leper. And he knew that in a short time he was going to be thrown out of the military, and he was going to be just a, a person going around with a little bell saying, Keep away, keep away, keep away. I'm a leper, I'm a leper, I'm a leper. And he heard a little slave girl from Israel tell about a wonderful man that could heal him over in Israel. And he went to his king and the king said, if anybody in Israel can heal you, please go. And he went. And when he finally came to this man after a number of experiences, the prophet said, go to the Jordan and dip seven times. And on the seventh time, you will be healed. He told the servant to tell him that, in fact, the prophet didn't even come out to see the general. The general was there in all of his uniform and all of his men, and the prophet just stayed back in the kitchen somewhere. Didn't even come out and greet him. Just sent word to him. And the general turned away in disgust. But one of his captains said to him, or one of his aides said, Sir, if he had told you a hard thing, you would have done it. He said, Go to the Jordan. He said, yeah, but the Jordan River is muddy and our rivers are clear. That Jordan River can't do anything. He said, well, why don't you try, sir? You're a leper. You've got to do something. So the general went to the Jordan River and he dipped himself four or five times and he said, see, the leprosy is still there. It doesn't do any good. But sir, he said seven times. So Naaman went down for the seventh time and when he came up, his skin was clean whole. The thing that had saved him was the fact that he did what the prophet had told him. The greatest prophet of them all is Jesus Christ. And he says you must be born again. How do you become born again? Repenting of sin, that means you're willing to change your way of living and you'll say to God, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Simple, childlike. And then by faith receive him as your Lord and Master and Savior. And then be willing to follow him in a new life of obedience in which the Holy Spirit helps you as you read the Bible and pray and witness. If there's a doubt in your mind that you have been born again, I hope you'll settle it before you leave here tonight because the Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You just can't come to God any time you want to. You can only come when the Holy Spirit is drawing, and He's speaking to you tonight in answer to the prayers of thousands of people in Idaho and throughout the country. Come to Christ tonight. Why do I ask people to come publicly? We've seen several thousand people do what I'm going to ask you to do. I ask you to come publicly because Jesus said, if you don't acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. He 
he hung publicly for you on the cross. Certainly you can come in front of this audience in this beautiful stadium and receive him into your heart. I'm going to ask you to do that right now. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. But I'm going to ask you to come and stand here in front of the platform. And this is a symbolic act of an inward decision that you're making. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature. Then you can go back and join your friends. God bless you. It's wonderful to know that tonight can be a night of new beginning for you. You say, well, how? Take a moment to call that number on your screen or to write to Billy Graham tonight or this week and let him know about your desire and we'll send you some from our archives the Billy Graham classics one of the television networks ran a series of five programs on the early days of Christianity and they included the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, one of the most graphic pictures I have ever seen. And among all the emblems of the world, none is admired, glorified, and worshipped as the cross. It was the instrument of Christ's suffering and death, and it's also the instrument of our salvation. The history of the cross is very interesting because it goes back to India, it goes back to China, long before Christ ever came. And the victim, as you know, was fastened to the cross by cords, or his hands were nailed, and he was left to die. And the heat of the sun, the pull of his body, and the torture that he'd had before he was on the cross, it took sometimes two and three days, and sometimes a week, for a person to die on a cross. The most terrible, the most awful, the most painful way to die that we can imagine. But by the time of Constantine in the fourth century, and he had become a Christian or a professing Christian, it was as an instrument of torture, it had been abolished. And later, Christian nations started to use the cross as a symbol of Christianity. It was embossed upon their chariots, upon whatever they had. And the cross became the symbol of everything that Christianity stood for. And through such organizations as the Red Cross, it's become an international sign of goodwill and help to other people. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, it says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again to repentance, seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Every time the gospel is proclaimed, those who hear the message and receive Christ as Savior come by the way of the cross. But if you neglect or refuse God's offer of love and mercy from the cross, you help crucify Jesus Christ. That's the reason it's wrong to say that the Jews crucified Christ, as Christians said, especially in the Middle Ages, and they used to make, try to make Jews converts at the end of a sword, or point a gun at their head, or a knife at their throat to try to make them converted, because they said they were Christ killers. They did not kill Christ. Do you know who killed Christ? All of us. We all had a part in his death because his death was planned before the foundation of the world because of sin and the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God there are four dimensions of the cross that I think about when I talk about it I think about the breadth of the cross the love of Christ is manifested in the cross of Christ that includes everybody 
God's love extends to Africa, to Asia, to Latin America, to Russia, to China, to America, to Canada, to the whole world. It includes you, whoever you are, whatever your religion, or if you have no religion, God loves you. And he says from the cross, I love you. Then there's the length of the cross. It has no measure. It extends from eternity to eternity, from everlasting to everlasting. When Noah built the ark, do you know how long it was? 450 feet long. When Solomon built the temple, you know how long it was? 60 cubits. If you build a shed for garden tools, you can measure the lumber with a ruler. But how can you measure the end to end of God's love in the cross? The Bible says, Paul said that God's love surpasses knowledge. There's no way that our finite minds can even begin to understand the love of God that would give his son on the cross to die for you. Because you and I deserve that death. We deserve hell and judgment. And then I think of the height of the cross. It extends to the throne of God. It doesn't matter how high heaven is. Through the cross, God draws all men to him. And you have to make a decision about Jesus Christ. Scientists are looking out into space further and further and further, but they can't get away from God. The subject of uh, astronomy and the subject of the space frontier is very exciting to me. There are scientists here tonight who know far more about the height of the universe than I can ever explain. But heaven is out there somewhere. We don't know exactly where. You say, do you believe heaven is a place? Yes, I believe it's a place. I believe I'm going to see the golden streets and walk on them. And I believe I'm going to live in a, well, I think I'll live in a shack. Some of you will live in mansions. Yes, heaven is going to be a glorious place. And you cannot go beyond God's love even in heaven. And then the depth of God's love and the cross. You can fall to the very bottomless pit of sin and degradation. And you can live like an animal. You can be a murderer. You can be a rapist. You can be anything. But you can't get beyond the love of God. The cross covers the, to the very gates of hell. How deep is it? There are people today that are trying to find how deep they can go into the heart of the earth. And how deep space is. They can't get away from God. Because as we study the depths of energy, we're looking for unity. That's one of the reasons they're making that study in Illinois. And the Bible says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It can draw every sinner up to the exalted height of heaven. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, said Jesus. Think of the cross a moment and think of his suffering for you and for me. It said that Jesus endured five basic wounds that medical science defines as first Contussion, when they beat him on the head and tortured him and put a crown of thorns on him for you. Laceration, they bared his back and took long leather whips with steel pellets on the end and beat him until he was bleeding from head to toe. That was the Roman way. They tortured prisoners before they took them to the cross. Then there was penetration when they crushed that crown of thorns on his brow and his head bled. There was perforation when they drove the nails through his hands and feet. There was incision when they put the spear in his side. That suffering, those nails through his hands and feet, were driven by you and me and all the peoples of the world because we all had a part in the death of Christ because of our sins. Our sins put him to the cross. And you participated. You may be watching the television somewhere. And you would like to come to the cross tonight.
and find God's love and God's forgiveness and God's touch on your life. You'll see on the screen there a number. You can call it. And their counsel is standing by ready to talk with you. You might have to call several times, but keep calling. You'll get somebody. They'll be there all evening. And they'll help you and send you some literature to help you understand and to help you live the Christian life. And I'm going to ask people here after a while to come to Christ. And then I want us to look at the cross from another point of view. I want us to look at the sayings of Christ from the cross. We usually hear a sermon like this on Good Friday and that's about it. But most of us don't go to church on Good Friday. So we never hear it. There are 28 prophecies in the Old Testament about the cross. Whole chapters. There's Genesis 22 and Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and Leviticus 16 that especially deal with the suffering of Christ on the cross hundreds and thousands of years before he ever went to the cross. They were under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the writers of the Old Testament. And the first one comes from Psalm 22. Jesus was quoting scripture when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a quote from Psalm 22. But then you go on a little bit further and you'll see why he said it. Because the scripture says, Thou art holy. You'll never understand the Old Testament with all of its blood sacrifices. You'll never understand the Bible. You'll never understand the death of Christ on the cross till you understand that God is a holy and righteous and pure God and he cannot even look upon evil. So in that terrible moment of the agony of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, he was lonely, forsaken by his friends. And then a shadow comes for the first time since eternity began between God the Father and God the Son because God cannot look upon sin because in that moment he was laying your sins and mine on Christ and Christ was suffering for us and in that mysterious moment he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin do you know what that means made to be sin had never known sin never told a lie never had an evil thought never had any greed or lust, all of a sudden, all of that filth and dirt from your life and my life descended on him. And none of us will ever understand the mystery of that moment. No theologian can explain it, to my satisfaction at least. It was God's great love for you that allowed his son to take that suffering and then the second thing from the cross that we hear is when he said I thirst and that's a fulfillment of Psalm 69 21 and when he said I thirst they gave him vinegar and drink mingled with gall and when he had tasted thereof he would not drink it he tasted as we read later in John in, in another one of the Gospels but he didn't drink it. Why? Because it would have been a sedative. It would have taken away some of the suffering. And he was there to do, to take all the suffering in absolute consciousness for you and for me. He wouldn't take it. He must suffer the terrible agony and carry our sins on the cross in full consciousness for you. And if you had been the only person in the whole world, he would have died for you. And then in Luke 23, 34 is another thing that he said from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Now he was talking about those soldiers that were nailing him, the crowd out there that was yelling and screaming at him. 72,000 angels pulled their swords ready to come and rescue him and he said no I'm doing it because I love them 
You see, you and I had sinned against God. We'd broken his laws and he said, in the day that you break my law, you will suffer and die. He said that to Adam and Eve. They broke his law. They sinned. That's what sin is. And you see, God never meant that anybody would ever die. And God did not create hell for us. But we deliberately rebelled against God and God would not be God, he wouldn't be just and righteous and holy if he came along and patted us on the back and said, you're forgiven. We had to die for our own sins or somebody who was qualified had to die for us and that person that was qualified was Jesus Christ and he volunteered to do it. He died in our place. I heard about a woman writing to a columnist and said that her cure for guilt was to go to the back garden, dig a hole in the earth, lie down on her stomach, speak all of her guilt and confess all of her wrongs into that place that she had dug and then cover it up. And people will do almost anything to get rid of their guilt. The place to get rid of guilt is at the cross. For centuries, people have done desperate things to bury their guilt. James Nelson, that we have read about last year, as a boy, in an alcohol-soaked scene, beat his mother to death with a brick. He served nine years in prison, and during that time, he met Christ at the cross. And the deep repentance and confession of Christ as his Savior and his law. He began to study the Bible. He began to be a lay preacher. And last year he was ordained in the Church of Scotland as a Presbyterian minister. The forgiveness of God, the love of God, the power of the cross to change and forgive. How wonderful and thrilling. And then another thing that he did at the cross that is one of the most touching things to me in all the world. Now there stood by the cross his mother. And he looked to John, one of his disciples, and he said, John, behold this woman. And, she said, and he said to Mary, his mother, he called her woman, just like he did at Cana of Galilee, he called her twice woman. He said, Woman, behold thy son. And from that hour on, John, his friend and his disciple, took care of his mother. There's a rock group in England called The Cure. Jesus Christ on the cross was the cure for all our human severed and ailing relationships. All the social problems, the oppressed peoples of the world feel the impact of his death on the cross. And then there was another statement from the cross. He said, it is finished. It is finished. What did he mean? In John 17, he had said, I finished the work that thou hast given me to do. God gave him a job to do, and the job was to die on the cross. To this end was I born, he said. He came to die. He's the only man ever born to die. That was why he came. We wonder why he didn't feed everybody and heal everybody. He could have done it. That would have healed some bodies and fed some people that were hungry and he, he did that out of compassion. But his real work was the cross. And that's why the cross is so important because there you're dealing with eternity. You see, the body is going to go to the grave, but your soul, your spirit, that part of you that lives forever, that lives inside of your body, is going to live on and on and on and on. Where is it going to spend eternity? Heaven or hell? It'll be decided by the cross, what you do about the cross. Because from the cross, he's asking you to repent of sin and receive him as Lord and Savior. Yes, it is finished. And then... He said something else in Luke 23. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Now, I've seen a few people die. Quite a number of people die. 
I've heard the death rattle in their throat. But there was no death rattle in the throat of Jesus. They did not take his life from him. He laid it down voluntarily. And he said in a loud voice, notice a loud voice, he said, I commend my spirit. Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. He gave up his spirit to God the Father. And in saying this, he conferred upon every one of us the possibility of the gift of eternal life. You can have eternal life tonight. And you that are watching by television can pick up that telephone and call that number on your screen. And someone will be there to talk to you about receiving this Christ. We were lost, confused, without purpose and meaning in life. No assurance of a future life. And Jesus from the cross reached out by death and rescued us. And we say to him today, Lord and Savior. Are you sure he's your Lord and your Savior? Thousands of people go to church, but they're not sure that they've committed their lives to Christ. And then lastly, there was the statement that he made to a thief on the cross. The crowds down below were shouting, if you're the son of God, come down and save yourself. Others were saying he saved others himself, he cannot save. They were mocking, they were jeering, they were laughing. Both of the thieves were criticizing. You see, he was on the cross for six hours, and the first three hours they were both criticizing him and making fun of him like the crowds down below. But one of the thieves began to look. They were both guilty. They both deserved to die according to Roman law. But one of them began to look at Jesus. And he began to see something he'd never seen anywhere else before. He saw that Jesus was different, and he began to say to himself, He must be the Son of God. He must be Lord. And he rebuked the other thief, saying, Don't you fear God? We deserve what we're getting, but he's not, he hasn't done anything wrong. Then he turned to Jesus, and he said, Lord. And that word, Lord, means my very own Lord. He said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. What an act of faith. And Jesus said, what did Jesus say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. And the angels of heaven were watching to see who would be the first one that he would take to paradise. It was a thief that deserved hell. The forgiveness and the mercy of God is so far beyond our comprehension that, it, that we, cannot, we can hardly talk about. Yes, that thief is going to be in heaven and you're going to see him. Jesus took him by the death of the cross. Two thieves. Which are you? Which cross are you on? The one that's rejecting or neglecting or even making fun? Or are you the one that it receives and accepts? I'm asking you to make your commitment to Christ tonight just as simply. What do you have to do? Three things. First, you must repent of your sin. That word repent means to change. Change your way of living. Change your attitude. Now you cannot do it alone, but God will help you if you're willing. The second thing is by faith receive Christ into your heart. By faith, you cannot come intellectually alone. Man cannot come to God just with his mind. He has to come by faith like a little child trusting his father or mother. And then thirdly, you must be willing to follow him and serve him. It's not just receiving him, it's being a follower of his every hour of the day. You won't become perfect, but you'll change directions in your life. You're going this way, and you're turned by the Spirit of God, and you start a different way. 
And I'm going to ask you to do something we've seen hundreds of people do here every night. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want to know when I leave here tonight. The Bible says, he that hard with his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. You may never have a moment like this when you're so close to the kingdom of God again. Come tonight. You may be a member of the best church in town. You may be a counselor. You may be a choir member. You may be a clergyman. But you're not sure how you stand before God. And you want to come to the cross and find forgiveness of all your sins. And a certainty that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. You get up and come right now. Hundreds of you, just come straight down and stand here and make that commitment. There are many of you that have been watching by television. We're here in southern New England. Crusade being held in Hartford, in Connecticut. And every night we've seen hundreds of people come and make the commitment to Christ. And you see tonight hundreds more are coming. You can make that commitment where you are, at home. You may be in a hotel room. You may be in a bar. Wherever you are. Pick up the phone and call the number on the screen and there'll be somebody there to talk to you. Again, we'd like to encourage you to make this your moment of decision. And take a few moments to make that telephone call and talk to someone who is ready to talk with you. We have phones all across the country where people who are standing by are praying that God will speak to you through his word and through the message tonight. So you make that telephone call could well be the most important call you could ever make. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now, toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your...
ready to ride.